starting. Started. Um, my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the last event sponsored by the Tohri Lecture Series today, uh, this semester, excuse me. Uh, today also. And today as well. <laughs> I'm Aurelien Kriyuz and I direct the Tohri uh, program at uh, Indiana. Thank you for taking time to be with us this afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Dali Boroha uh, from the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, will be talking today about polycentrism, sovereignty, and international cooperation. Uh, both the Tokyo program and the Ostrom uh, workshop are sponsoring this talk uh, because it deals with a topic that was central to the work of uh, Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom, the founding father, fathers and mothers of this center. Um, Dr. Rohak is a research fellow uh, at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., fellow at the University of Buckingham in the UK and a research associate at the Martin Center in Brussels in Belgium. He's the author of Towards an Imperfect Union, a conservative case for the European Union, which was uh, included on the Foreign Affairs magazine list as one of the best books of 2016. Dalibor's non-academic writing um, includes <coughs> articles published in various outlets such as Washington Post and the New York Times, also known as Fake News Times. Uh, his PhD is from uh, King's College, London, and it is my uh, pleasure to welcome him to uh, the workshop. The format will be the standard one. Uh, Dalibor will speak for about 40 minutes. You can ask him any clarificatory questions during the presentation, and then we'll uh, open up for a discussion that will follow uh, his presentation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dalibor. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me just begin by saying what an enormous pleasure it is to be here with you today. I want to thank Aurelian for inviting me and, and Alison, who is not here, for, for, for organizing my trip so marvelously. Uh, I should probably preface this by saying that as a think tanker, I have mostly given up on pursuing academic work. Um, but visiting the Austrian workshop has been one of those things that were for a long time on my bucket list, and, <laughs> and, and, and I consider myself very lucky to, to be here, although I'm no longer really playing the academic game and trying to get into mm -hmm. journals and, 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 and so forth. Um, the other disclaimer is that although I work for the American Enterprise Institute, I'm not myself American, as you might have guessed from my, from my accent. Uh, I was brought up in Slovakia. Um, I lived through the fall of uh, communism in 1989, and it really was that experience of, of, of the collapse of communism and the transition of the 1990s that made me interested in economics and social sciences, and, and I guess if there is an sort of overarching theme to, to, to my own interest, it, it revolves very much around this question of why some countries did so much better than others in the aftermath of, 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 of the fall of communism. And that's a complex question, and there is a massive literature uh, on what strategies worked, what strategies didn't work, what should have been done, etc., etc. Economists to this day disagree, uh, partly because you know it's hard to conduct uh, controlled experiments over over one of uh, historic events of, 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 of that magnitude. But but in my opinion, uh, one sort of non-economic factor does stand out a lot, namely uh, the importance of geopolitics or, or the international environment in which some of these countries uh, found themselves. Just to take an obvious example, look at Poland and Ukraine. These are countries that in 1990 started from a, a very similar point. When you look at GDP per capita, any metric of, of, of well-being, health, uh, life expectancy, etc., etc., even sort of structurally those economies were not that far uh, away from, 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 from each other. Um, the big difference, obviously, was that Poland had the prospect of joining NATO and the European Union and pushed through fairly painful reforms early on, uh, transformed itself into a vibrant market economy governed by a relatively clean uh, political system. We can you know, talk about what's been happening in Poland lately, uh, which, which I'll sort of set aside for the moment, but, but Ukraine clearly did not have 
the access to the same sort of international commitment devices as, 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 as Poland. And uh, with that anchor missing, uh, it was just much more difficult to push for painful reforms that would have brought about uh, the, the, the results later on. So when you look at Poland today, it's, it's almost three times wealthier than Ukraine. And, 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 and the sort of gap between, between those two have, has widened on, on any, any number of so what I would like to do today is to talk briefly about uh, a book project I'm working on, which is not primarily an academic book project, uh, but it's one that is very much inspired by some of the thinking that's been going on uh, in the in the Ostrom uh, workshop. Uh, it's a you might have some of you might have seen fragments of of, of, of this book, which which are circulated ahead of the meeting, but I don't. I don't expect anybody to have, have read any of it. Uh, and, and, and the motivation for, 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 for this project is, is relatively simple. So, so the international environment that, in my view, enabled the successful transition in Eastern Europe, that enabled the 100 million people to, to, today to live under democratic capitalism, if you will, uh, is coming under stress. Uh, if you follow the news, you, you, you're well aware of uh, the populist backlash, if you will, against the post-1945 international order happening on, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, that backlash uh, is happening for reasons that are understandable and should be, I think, sort of thought through, should be taken seriously, should be engaged with. Uh, for example, we lived through a significant financial crisis starting in 2008. There is uh, quite a bit of evidence that support for uh, extremist politics of various stripes rises in the aftermath of financial shocks. A famous paper by, by Alan de Broomhead and co-authors who look at the period going back to 1870. Uh, there, and, and there are also, I think, sort of real sort of structural issues to be discussed in the well, when it comes to the architecture of this international order, the sort of fact that there are segments of populations in, in the West who believe that this system is not, not delivering for them. That the burden sharing within NATO is, is one, 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 one such area. And, and the fact that, yes, there were wars in Iraq and Afghanistan which have been sort of seen as failure of the system or failures of, of, of political elites and have produced understandable, understandable backlashes. Uh, there are structural changes in economies in America and in Europe which you know, change the nature of the labor markets uh, in ways that might make some people worse off and may contribute to a perception that the economy is a zero-sum game and, 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 and that the system isn't working. On top of that, there is a changing media landscape, uh, the emergence of new platforms, uh, which might, which seem, I mean, it, I, the evidence on this is not clear, but, but they seem to have contributed to polarization <coughs> And, and a sort of loss of trust in, 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 in political institutions. So, so I think all these factors are sort of understandable and worth studying carefully, but I don't think that the sort of overall thrust that, that you know, the sort of, of, of the politics that results from it should be one that people should be cheering for. Yet, I find many of my friends on the political right uh, doing exactly that. Uh, people who have been for a long time distrustful of the post-1945 international system, uh, who, uh, who I think are so risking to sort of serve as cheerleaders for, 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 for policy changes that, that might uh, carry dramatic risks for, for, for peace, economic openness, and other things. So sometimes people make the parallel between our present age and the 1930s, and sometimes, and my reaction typically is that those parallels are overblown. I mean, I don't, I don't fear the descent of this country into totalitarianism or or, 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 or the Republic of Gilead, uh, but I think there are valid lessons to be drawn from the experience of the 1930s, particularly when it comes to uh, to the fragility of of the international environment in which we are we are living. So. So one particular source of inspiration for this book uh, 
are really are the debates that were happening at the end of the 1930s between various classical liberals. Uh, there was the Walter Lippmann colloquium convened in Paris in 1938. Walter Lippmann was, a, was an American journalist who published an influential book uh, a year before. Uh, as a bunch of so free market thinkers convened in Paris uh, just months before the outbreak of the Second World War uh, to, to discuss this book. And uh, actually, the thrust of the discussion moved in the direction of, of sort of international political economy and, and sort of international affairs. Um, people who were there included Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, Wilhelm Rapke, Raymond Aron, uh, Jacques Rueff, who later became the goal's economic advisor, was Michael Polanyi, uh, coined the term polycentrism, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and what happened was that in various ways, all these thinkers came uh, either at the workshop or after the workshop, in support of some idea of international federalism as a solution to the problem that they were seeing in Europe and in the West more broadly. And an essay that came out just a year later, in 1939, Hayek stresses uh, that the biggest blind spot of 19th century classical liberalism was that it didn't pay enough attention to the importance of the international environment. It was sort of taken for granted that these uh, that this sort of cobweb of bilateral trade agreements would, would just remain in place, that there was like no way of, 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 of undoing it. Um, in 1944, uh, Ludwig von Mises, Australian economist who became a sort of icon for, for the US libertarian movement after the Second World War, just published his first book in America after arriving, uh, after escaping from, from, from Europe, really. Um, the essay is called Omnipotent Government, and there he uh, makes this sort of stark claim that the small nations of Europe have the choice of either being free men in an international sort of federalist democracy or to be enslaved by totalitarian powers. So that's, you know, that's, Ludwig, that's the Ludwig von Mises who, a few years later, stormed out of a meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, smashing the door, saying, you're all a bunch of socialists. So, so, so that same guy uh, came in support of international federalism. Uh, the, the Germans, the sort of Eukens and Repkes, etc., they, they actually played an instrumental role in shaping the post-war European project. We sometimes think of the EU as a product of Jean Monnet-style uh, technocratic functionalism and, and, and sort of left of center sort of desire to, to put forward centralized solutions to everything, uh, so driven by a sort of progressive mindset of the era. Uh, but actually, the German or the liberals uh, were quite influential, were quite vocal, and, 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 and shaped, shaped the project uh, as well. Now my theory is that uh, the same sort of blind spots that Hayek talked about in reference to the previous iterations of classical liberalism can be found uh, on the same, in the, the same circles uh, today. Um, when you look at so, you know, American libertarians, uh, they have embraced a fairly crude version of realism that just sees nation states as pursuing ruthlessly their national interest. It, it sort of sees institutions, international organizations, treaties, and various forms of government, governance as a mere facade. Um, on the conservative side of the spectrum, uh, there is what I believe is an unhealthy obsession with national sovereignty. There is a total distrust of any forms of international cooperation, any forms of pooling of, 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 of decision making. And, and needless to say, all of these blind spots, I think, have gotten worse in recent years. So what I'm trying to achieve with the book is essentially the default. Um, this is what I'd like to show to my friends on the political right, that the simplistic dichotomy between fully sovereign nation states on the one side and some unaccountable, tyrannical international organizations on the, on the other side. Uh, that, 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 that dichotomy does not provide a very good framework for thinking about uh, the trade-offs that are involved in international cooperation. Because there are trade-offs. Uh, but the choice is far more complicated than the choice between sovereignty and submission. 
which is a diet love a book by Jeremy Rapkin, a legal scholar at George Mason University, which has been quite influential. Uh, you know, John Bolton, my former colleague at the AEI, has written about this in very stark terms uh, as well. Uh, so I would like people to move beyond uh, that distinction. And uh, furthermore, I would like to show that the polycentric approach uh, developed originally by, by Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom can, can provide a better job both in explaining how the international system actually operates and also in providing a sort of blueprint for reform of existing institutions because I think it's sort of impression that not everything is working perfectly in the, in the international realm, that not every international organization has a stellar record. I think that impression is correct and people should do something about it. So, so jointly I would like to translate this into a positive agenda for reasonable people on the centre right uh, on, on you know, what, what to do, what, what to do next, and, and how to possibly answer some of the legitimate concerns that that, 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 that have fueled some of the some of the popular backlash we are we are seeing. So, so, the starting point of the book, which is by two thirds written in a sort of rough draft form, and I can still take it in different different directions, and I really would appreciate feedback from. From, 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 from you. Is, the starting point is that global governance, as it's sometimes called, is not the one thing. That there are many different things that are happening in the world. That there is there is a sort of sheer diversity of institutional forms and, and subject matters and ways governments and, and local governments and, and, and private sector sort of agents cooperate across borders, create rules, and various various commitment mechanisms. So yes, there is this sort of pipe dream of, of a global government that many people, thinkers, you know, going back centuries have, have, have referred to. Uh, but, you know, we, we just had sort of 70 years of sort of international cooperation happening after the Second World War, and there is no indication that these new international structures are in any way replacing the nation state or, or, or eroding the authority of, 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 of nation states. Instead of sort of evolving towards a single source of political authority, some people are sort of thinking that maybe the UN could play that role after the war. Uh, so the world federalists were, were an association that, that Albert Einstein was part of, sort of hoping for 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 for, for UN and a sort of global parliament to replace uh, nation states. But that, that that hasn't really happened. What happened was what some people call a Cambrian explosion of different <laughs> organizational forms. Uh, connecting sometimes national governments, sometimes local governments, uh, civil society actors, etc., etc. These institutions deal with a immense diversity of, 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 of different sort of problems, many of which, but not all of them, actually cross national borders. Uh, now we can talk about international trade, we can talk about finance. It's fairly obvious, I think, sitting here in 2018, that financial regulation in a place like Iceland can have repercussions elsewhere. Um, that it's not sort of confined to the narrow borders of, 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 of one country. We can talk about environmental questions. You know, climate change is the most extreme of, 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 of examples of some global commons uh, that, have, that really pay very little, little attention to, 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 to national borders. There are security questions, there are you know, questions of technical standards, travel, etc., etc. In the age of globalization, all of these cross-border issues uh, are becoming more and more uh, prominent. Um, so my view of global governance, so to speak, is, is not a panglossian one. So I don't, I, I do believe there has been a lot of over-promising and under-delivery in this realm. Uh, very often the institutional structures created have, were not adapted to, to their own stated uh, city goals. And I, don't believe that every global problem or problem of global commons requires one unified global uh, response. But the point I would like to sort of put forward to, to many of my friends is, 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 is narrower. Uh, one, the, the current effort to sort of cleanse the world of such structures and platforms for international cooperation is counterproductive uh, because there is exactly zero risk that the world will be taken over by unaccountable global government or or by uh, as an aside or that like the Europe will be 
will be crushed under the diktat of, of, of bureaucrats from, 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 from Brussels. Um, um, as, as I said, the, you know, the reality is that we are not moving in, 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 in that direction. And, and if anything, um, sort of, sort of the worst case scenario with sort of maladaptive, overreaching institutions, organizations uh, at, in, at the international level is that they sort of grow into irrelevance and become caricatures of, 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 of themselves. And you could find a sort of plethora of, of UN agencies that you could find that, 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 that could fall into that category. So, so I don't want to denigrate the UN or, or, or any other sort of international organization in particular, but, but to me, the most consequential milestone really in, 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 in enabling international cooperation and, and sort of channeling it in, in productive ways uh, was the response to the threat of, of, of international communism after the Second World War. Creation of uh, NATO and the Marshall Plan, which helped <coughs> give the sort of foundation to, to, to further European cooperation through, through, through European integration, and the world trading system based on based on rules, uh, and much of it underwritten really by, by the United States and, and the role uh, this country has played in the world. Uh, it's something we often take for granted, uh, but that should not be taken for granted. And, and under that broad umbrella, we then observed this, this unprecedented development of formal and informal ways of sort of cooperating. Uh, and, and what I would like to uh, sort of look at is to sort of identify the patterns of success of that cooperation and, and, and failure and to see if those patterns of success and cooperation might be in any way linked to sort of the uh, sort of polycentric features of, 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 of such systems. My suspicion, and this is not a sort of rigorous Academically, my suspicion is that the success stories which we are seeing uh, would coincide by, with, with, with uh, sort of institutional structures that are direct outgrowths of self-governing free societies uh, that abide more or less by, by the design principles uh, articulated by, uh, by, by, by Eleanor and Rostrom. Um, but that's a sort of, to some extent, an open question. Uh, what's not so much an open question is that uh, this period of development of global institutions and platforms for international cooperation coincides with a period of human history that's been incredibly kind to, to us, incredibly kind to humankind. When you look at uh, interstate violence, when you look at you know, any metrics of, of, of poverty, disease, illiteracy, uh, economic well-being, health, uh, things have been getting uh, better since 1945 in, in, in a way not seen before. So real global GDP has increased 13-fold since 1945. Global population increased four, time, four, four times in the, in the meantime. Uh, if current trends continue, global uh, um, extreme poverty subsistence at less than $1.25 a day disappear altogether by 2030. Um, arguably, much of this has to do with the rising levels of economic openness, which brought poor countries to global markets. Uh, if you look at sort of average tariff rate after the war, there is some disagreement on that, but like, for like big industrial economies, it was above 20%. Today, it would be probably below 5%. Um, it's also hard to argue that the sort of explosion of, of international cooperation has somehow corroded democracy and, 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 and hampered self-governance, as, as some people would suggest. If anything, metrics of, sort of you know, democracy has spread around the world, even, even the sort of more recent deconsolidations and, 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 and reversals have, have not really sort of wiped out the, the gains that we've seen since Second World War in terms of spreading good governance and, and, and accountability. In spite of climate change and, and various other forms of environmental degradation, there have been some good news. The forest areas in advanced countries are growing. Uh, 
cropland erosion has has declined. Uh, there is less greenhouse acid gases emitted by, by agriculture. Uh, sometimes there are success stories from, from the realm of uh, so fairly heavy-handed government it's cooperation uh, and the, the elimination of CFC and, uh, emissions. Uh, in other cases, such efforts have been less successful, particularly with climate change. Uh, I guess I'll talk about you know, what might be a good response to, 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 to that challenge going, going forward. Um, but I guess the, the observation is uh, that the reality of global governance is something very different from, from the way it's sort of depicted by, by many of its critics. So the, the fragmentation and the diversity uh, is, uh, you know, that, that's bad news if you're a utopian thinker who hopes for a single global government, but it's also bad news if, uh, if, if, if you sort of try to see Global governance is some slippery slope aiming to replace self governing nations with an unaccountable global government. Thankfully, we don't have to fall into either of those camps. There are analytical tools expressly developed to deal with institutional diversity and, and, and fragmentation, namely you know, the, the policy centric approach. So, what I would like to encourage uh, not just sort of scholars who are working on this, but also foreign policy practitioners in Washington to do is to embrace this way of thinking more more, more, more more, fully as an alternative, especially as an alternative to this dichotomy between national sovereignty and the, the bogey men of global governance. And so, so Mike McGuinness and, and the Nostrum wrote in, in the 1990s that the substantive nature of any local and global problems is similar, despite vast differences in the scale involved uh, the underlying logical configuration of common pool resource situations at these levels is fundamentally similar. Thus, the theoretical principles underlying successful cooperation at both levels are also similar. Um, Vincent Ostrom took a sort of more explicitly normative bent almost in his discussion of these problems. So he, he writes shortly after the fall of, 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 of the Berlin Wall, a uh, few years later, um, that if a polycentric system is to be extended literally through the whole system of human affairs, it is necessary to explore the application of polycentricity to the realm of international affairs as, as well. Now clearly, international cooperation is not just about common pool resources. There is a much broader sort of class of problems. Uh, you know, everybody here is sort of versed in game theory, so there are public groups problems, there are coordination problems, there are coordination sort of problems where different actors have different preferences over which, which equilibrium they want. Uh, and I think sort of the institutional responses to, to these different strategic situations have to, have to be different as well. Um, for example, if you're trying to encourage cooperation in producing public goods, you might want to see a long shadow of the future incentivizing people to not, not to remain. Uh, there are significant distributional questions involved, uh, you might not want to see such a long shadow of the future to motivating people because that means that it will be less hard to renegotiate the way people are compensated or like react to, 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 to changes going forward. So I think there's sort of, yeah, there are no silver bullets really. There's sort of, the design has to respond to the underlying strategic situations. Uh, and so sometimes that requires more formal cooperation, more explicit forms of enforcement. Uh, sometimes when we are talking about you know technical standards, those can be voluntary. It's a matter of coordinating. Uh, give me a focal point, and I'll do everything like the same thing as everybody else is doing because that, that makes that makes most, more, more, most sense. And when you look at actually how standardization proceeds, it's it's not through government fiat. It's not through top-down impositions. It's by uh, essentially industries and, and local national certification agencies getting together and producing voluntary standards that are then used, or sometimes not. Um, so, if, so there are a like, few sort of lessons from uh, from, 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 from the Ostrom's work on, um, on on coming to resources and 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 centric governance. Uh, it strikes me that successful policy governance 
needs sort of clearly defined boundaries and, and rules that are subject to change, possibly by, by the participants themselves. Uh, successful governance as policy centric needs the possibility of exit. <coughs> and in, in the international realm, always exists de facto, does not always exist necessarily like explicitly uh, in, 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 in those treaties that are signed. You need monitoring, uh, you need some form of sanctions, if, if, if applicable, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, and you need participants that are autonomous in their decision making. So that's sometimes a problem, actually, when you think about uh, the mandates of some of these international organizations and, 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 and treaties. Very often we see sort of open-ended aspirational initiatives that are not limited necessarily to cross-border issues. You know, so aspirational human rights conventions that are signed by autocratic regimes. Uh, we've seen in the European Union uh, the fact that the governance has not been limited to subjects that, where there is a sort of compelling sort of cross-border rationale to act. There has been uh, a harmonization of social protection standards across the EU, for example. There has been uh, a sort of very active role that, that, that the EU played in uh, subsidizing agriculture, which yeah, doesn't really sort of, there's like clear, clear cross-border sort of externality rationale. Uh, for that. So, so the trouble with that is that very often in these situations, international cooperation can be seen as an effort to change domestic policy through the back door. And, and it's in those situations that, that the critics are justified to, 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 to push back. And um, but, but if, if I have to highlight just sort of one thing that, that, that has been on my mind lately as, as perhaps the most important precondition for successful policy-centric governance internationally. It is this sort of idea that, I'm not sure if it's been sort of explicitly stated in, in Eleanor's and Vincent's work, but, but, but I think the sort of underlying tacit assumption is, is, is that the participants are sort of like-minded in, in what they, in, in, in how they perceive strategic situation that that, 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 that that at some fundamental level the interests are 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 are, 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 are sort of aligned and and what that means in my opinion in the international realm is that there is a fundamental difference between governance structures that are created by free self-governing democratic societies and those that are spearheaded by by authoritarian or totalitarian regimes and I think that's a sort of very clear sort of practical conclusion of, 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 of this way of thinking. So, so we now see you know, China involved in a very, very sort of ambitious project of, sort of connecting China with, with Europe through parts of Central Asia. To finance that, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank was set up. Uh, Russia actually has a small investment bank as well based in Moscow that includes a number of Central European countries that are part of the EU and also countries like Vietnam, Cuba uh, and Mongolia. Uh, and, and so, so, so again, my, it's not a sort of academic claim, but my suspicion is that those structures are very different and I would expect them to behave very differently from uh, organizations like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development or the European Investment Bank. And that they would sort of report, uh, respond to very different sort of motivations and and uh, incentives. Uh, slightly different point I was I was I was hoping to make today uh, is is that there really is a frequent mistake made by people who defend national sovereignty against globalism or global governance uh, in in their assuming that the nation state is somehow a natural baseline of human history. So there's a recent book that came out by the Israeli writer, uh, philosopher Yoram Hazomi, which is called The Virtue of Nationalism, uh, which does exactly that. It, it sort of posits nation states and political nations in Europe as, as an extension or outgrowth of pre-existing clans and 
different tribes. And I think it's, it's completely ahistorical and it's been sort of debunked in, 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 in many ways. And modern nation states are not the outcomes of deliberate political projects that very often sort of destroy the pre existing tribal or, 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 or clan related uh, identities. And it's something that really sort of resonates with some people on the center right, especially in conservative circles in the English speaking world. But I think it's even, it's completely at odds with sort of deeper uh, sort of traditions of conservative thinking in Europe. When you look at uh, um, the distinctly European tradition of personalism, which is tied to, to, to Catholic social teaching, which sort of goes back to the early parts of the 20th century. Uh, but those thinkers uh, really saw the nation state as uh, it's almost Jacobinic in its sort of, in its sort of claiming this totality of authority over over certain territory, and, and they have a much more sort of covenantal vision of sort of human association and, and, and governance, which which I think is something that that that, that sort of the Ostrom's work is, is, is very well uh, attuned to attuned to as well. So just to uh, run you through, through what I have in the rest of the book. There is a chapter on trade, especially uh, on, on sort of the successes of trade liberalization <coughs> in the Second World War, um, the interplay between the sort of global rules that have been created uh, multilaterally and, 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 and the various sort of regional arrangements that have been dropped uh, later. And, and so what I would like to sort of show to my friends is that there are trade-offs involved in trade liberalization, particularly as you move away from just removing tariffs and quotas and ordinary forms of protectionism and try to start worrying about uh, regulatory divergence and, uh, and, and, and various sort of frictions that, uh, that really can be only eliminated by countries working more closely on how they govern the, the domestic economy. So there are trade-offs uh, and, and, and things become complicated. And, and we'll see that, I think, with Brexit is a sort of nice example of, 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 of some of the sort of hopeless naivete of people who were pushing it, believing that, oh, we'll disentangle ourselves from Brussels and, and from the EU, we'll regain sovereignty, and then we'll sort of enter into far-reaching trade agreements with countries around the world, uh, not realizing that those deep, far-reaching trade agreements with other countries will involve the exact same sort of questions as, like, you know, abiding by European standards. Various areas. I have also a chapter on national sovereignty, which uh, in my view means different things to different people. The sort of Westphalian idea of national sovereignty, uh, a sort of international institution. Uh, there is the idea of sovereignty uh, implicit in the US constitutional system. It's like we, the people who ordain the constitution, are, are sovereign. Uh, but in ordinary parlance, and especially in sort of political debate, sovereignty is used as a short term for, for control over policy and social and economic outcomes. Um, so, so I don't deny that there are sort of valid technical constitutional questions about how the United States could accede to various international commitments, this question of self-execution of treaties, the question of, of delegating. Etc. I'm largely agnostic about those things. It doesn't strike me that, unlike you know, my, my colleague John Yu, who teaches law at Berkeley, has been a critic of sort of U.S. involvement uh, in various international institutions on those constitutional grounds. Like, to me, I don't see uh, even if if I were to like accept uh, his reasoning at face value, it doesn't strike me that this would completely jeopardize U.S. participation in. in Organizations. I think it's sort of merely uh, raising the bar for certain certain forms of cooperation to to a higher level in a way uh, that requires perhaps a stronger political mandate. Uh, but really, the backlash which we are seeing against uh, global governance is not driven by technicalities of U.S. constitutional law. It's driven uh, by the fact that some voters feel that uh, things have got out of control. That, that sort of democratically accountable institutions don't have control over various sorts of policy outcomes. Well, the bad news is that control, in some absolute sense, was never on the menu. Even if you are, uh, you know, a large country like 
like maritime, it's, 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 it's becoming less and less on the menu uh, as, we, as we go forward. Um, and very often, uh, the sense of control or degree of control over outcomes is amplified, not weakened, by participating in these various forms of, of, of international cooperation. Again, Brexit is a, is a great example. The UK will leave, uh, will you know, disentangle itself from, 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 from the EU, but still, a large part of, 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 of the UK's trade will be with the European Union uh, by sort of you know, gravitation and necessity, if you will. Uh, and, and, and that will be guided by European rules over which the UK will no longer have a say, whereas it was a fairly influential, it still is a fairly influential member of the European Union today. So what I'd like to do with the book is to uh, really have a conversation, produce a conversation starter, especially on the center right, on how existing structures of international cooperation could be rebuilt along polycentric lines. I don't think there are any good alternatives. The world is becoming more tightly connected. Unless we want to become an autarkic version of North Korea, uh, I think this quest for absolute control or absolute national control over policies and, and, and social outcomes is, 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 is a bad idea. Um, Vincent Ostrom put it beautifully, uh, again, in, I think in, the, in the same book in, in the early 1990s, uh, when, he, when he stated that the nation states need not be viewed as the ultimate achievement in the organization of human societies. If patterns of associated relationships are to transcend national boundaries, rich networks of voluntary associations need to be complemented by rules that take account of communities of relationships that are multinational in character. It is federalism that provides the alternative to empire and opens communities in the light of 1989 for building up on an amplifying campus capacity for self-government. So I think that's the message that needs to be uh, heard more loudly today and also articulated again for the 21st century. Uh, on that note, I'll stop and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you. I'd like to invite any students to ask uh, first questions. And then we'll take one question at a time. I was criticized by some of the colleagues that I, I want to take two questions at a time. So we'll take one, but uh, we'll start with any students if they want to, to ask. Yes, okay. please. I'm Lulu from the University of Hong Kong. I'm urban planner, so I'm not very familiar with this topic. But I found this very interesting. Because in the urban program, we have something called externality. Mm -hmm. Different externality, you governed by different governments. Of, by different level of government. So I was thinking about when you're talking about all those problems, like climate change definitely should be governed by international organization because it's like global externality, but some problems should be governed by local government. Um, I think, um, I'm sure if I would do, I would put, um, I would have more clear picture of what are the problem I, problems I think should be governed by international governance what a problem should be not. So if you need the foundation, when you give your argument, I will, we would feel like, okay, um, we will follow you. Otherwise, we'll think, okay, that argument could be either wrong, could be either right, depends on the problem you're looking at. So, so, so I think the two um, factors that, that we have to look at are first, so the, the size and the existence of external effects, right? So, so is there something that sort of that I do that affects people elsewhere. Uh, and the second one, I think, has to do with a degree of, sort of homogeneity of preferences. Like, it's hard to achieve cooperation if, 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 if people or governments or, or you know, whatever actors you want to deal with like, see things fundamentally differently. Um, and so, so on issues where there is sort of alignment of, of, sort of preferences and large external effects, I think that makes sort of international cooperation easier and, and more likely to succeed. Uh, it does not necessarily translate into um, sort of specific forms of governance or, 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 or rules. I think that's always context specific. But with climate change, uh, it's, it's an interesting case because you clearly have large external effects. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, would, would, would dispute that. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent there is sort of alignment of 
interests or preferences. I mean, there are you know big polluters who want somebody else to sort of carry the burden, uh, and, and and as a result, again, okay, you go back to 2009 in Copenhagen, there was a failure to sort of agree on sort of binding sort of framework that would reduce emissions through uh, sort of local sort of cap and trade schemes uh, that would be somehow monitored centrally. And, and so, so if I understand what's been agreed in Paris. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat more flexible, and it gives uh, countries the possibility to sort of come up with voluntary targets, and also to sort of give space to, to other sort of levels of government to 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 sort of pitch in. So, so you know, after Trump's withdrawal from 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 the Paris Agreement, we've seen state governors in in America committing to emissions targets. Uh, there's also uh, a sort of incredible greening of sort of cities that's happening completely independently of sort of any top-down decisions. Uh, there is this Dutch uh, social scientist at King's College London, uh, Fran Franz Berkut, who just published a sort of large edited volume on sort of polycentrism in, 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 in climate governance. So, so, so my like, short answer is that uh, I think we sort of know what the sort of basic factors are that, that that make things sort of more amenable to, to international cooperation and governance, uh, but there are enormous sort of complexities in, in any given problem uh, that there are no silver bullet solutions. That there, I think, would be needed sort of framework that enables people to experiment, uh, that enables governments to experiment, that, that has feedback mechanisms, um, and that does not like rule out one class of like policy actions from 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 from. So, okay, okay. Um, if I can understand right, okay, I was just thinking about the problems in the, the um, why different um, Copenhagen or Paris, which more is effective. You mentioned the flexibility, but I don't know what does that uh, flexibility mean. Um, and there is one assumption you make is like uh, if there is a homogeneous interest incentives, it's more easy to success. But whether it can be success depends on whether those people who uh, have the greatest influence over the policy, also the residue climate, mm -hmm. if they are lot, even they have like very strong homogeneous um, incentives, then they cannot achieve the outcome because they are, they cannot, they are lot of the most influential players. So with the um, sort of the narrow question about Copenhagen and, 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 and Paris, I think the sort of short response is, is that uh, whereas Copenhagen had binding targets, um, Paris had targets that were voluntary and, 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 and so going forward, what, what was sort of positive was that countries would get together and sort of review their progress at regular intervals, but there were no mechanisms introduced to sort of force countries to to, to sort of take action other than their own voluntary commitments. Um, um, I want to say too, one, one of the differences between the 1930s and now is actually the existence of this huge institutional infrastructure yes. that itself appears, in, and here I'm going to address your dichotomy between authoritarian and liberal democratic institutions. The liberal democratic world created these institutions that now appear to be tools for authoritarian governments to use for their own purposes. And that effect seems to be growing. And after all, Putin makes billions, literally billions of dollars managing the UN's uh, fund after the first Iraq war, personally, because he was in charge of that. He's using UNESCO to capture pipelines around Palmyra, and recently the the fight, the skirmish over the Interpol chairmanship. So, so this simple dichotomy between good and bad institutions uh, isn't effective in this moment, I think, and <clears throat> because these institutions are subject to capture. I mean, they are subject to capture insofar as we, as we by. Democracies led 
the authoritarians come to the table and engage with them on the same terms as if you were like, talking to each other. It's, it's clear to me that like having Sweden as part of an international organization is something fundamentally different than having Russia as part of the same international organization. And that sort of the incentives facing Swedish policymakers and those facing Vladimir Putin are going to be different. And, and, and so, so I completely like, agree with, with the descriptive part of what you said. I think it's a problem. Um, and, and I think that, I, I guess, like part of like, the prescriptive work here is, is, is going to think about ways how uh, we can build institutions that will serve primarily self-governing societies. Um, and, and that will, you know, like, e you can't be part of the EU. I mean, that sort of, I don't know, maybe sounds questionable, but, but the idea was that you can't really join the EU unless you had certain standards of, of rule of law, democracy, self-governance, free media, etc., etc. Um, but if you're Victor Urban, you can stay in the EU. Well, that's the other thing that, that like these organizations have become like one-way ratchets, right? Like you, yeah. like how do we expel Turkey from NATO if need be, or are we like committed to the defense of Turkey under Erdogan? Uh, doesn't sound like a great idea to me. Uh, I think there need to be mechanisms in international organizations that somehow sanction countries that deviate from 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 from, from the rules in various ways. And, and I mean, having a representative of Putin's regime run Interpol was, was a very crazy call when I, when I sort of first, first saw it. And the fact that the Chinese had disappeared in, 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 in China. So, so it certainly so, limits the scope and goals of many international institutions if you're going to yes, right, them no. in that way. I, I, think it, I think it would. I think it would. And, uh, so, so of course there need to be like pragmatic ways of engaging with with countries that are governed differently, uh, but I think there is this sort of naive there sometimes, uh, which I see primarily on the sort of liberal circles, which, which sort of see sees the world as necessarily evolving on a sort of trajectory that that where the end point looks like 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 like, like us and like if you have societies that are not necessarily going to evolve into a version of, 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 of Europe or the United States. Uh, you can't pretend that they will. And, and I think so, much of the engagement uh, that happened in the 1990s in the noughties was sort of almost sort of based on the assumption that, that everybody wants to be like us, or that countries will more or liberal. sooner or, <laughs> that's, that's or later will adopt the same institutions that, that, that have been proven to work. Yeah, that was Ronald Reagan's vision. I'm not sure the Westminster speech. I'll, I'll stop. Please. Um, hi, I'm Tanya, um, and um, I'm from the Department of Anthropology and also from okay. And my question basically builds on what Lulu asked and uh, refers to what uh, Regina um, asked. Um, the idea of global governments. As, as far as I understood from this presentation, would imply that there are homogeneous interests. But these, um, these homogeneous interests are about heter among heterogeneous actors. And I think that's the, the key problem here, that um, as you mentioned, some countries would say, some states would have something more to state and more leverage to push for some decisions. The other thing is that um, there are existing institutions and there are regulations and rules in place at the moment that are violated and no sanctions and no mechanism can um, restrain or punish the uh, the violations like the Russian example. I mean, mm -hmm. a few days ago they violated the, the international treaty of, uh, in Azov Sea. Yeah. And at the moment there is no mechanism to, you know, to implement efficient decisions to influence this kind of behavior. So in your suggestions, what would be in, what new mechanism or what new ideas would be um, in place to, to solve these things? This is a hard one because I think it's ultimately a political problem. It's one where I don't think there's like a sort of, we can like engineer a sort of social scientific solution to this. Like if Viktor Orban is transforming Hungary into an authoritarian regime, and the 
and Brussels does nothing because that's the sort of more comfortable thing to do, uh, then yes, I mean, the whole project can be can be jeopardized. I mean, the alternative would be to sort of ruthlessly follow the process that has been triggered initially by the European Commission that could you know, lead to the suspension of Andrew's voting rights in the European Council, it could lead to you know, stopping the spigot, the inflow of, of, of European funds into Hungary, it could even escalate towards, towards sort of an expulsion of, of, of Hungary from the EU. Um, but it just, it's a very sort of unsatisfying answer, but, but I mean, there isn't sort of political leadership that would make that, that, would make that happen. I mean, it's, it can be done under the current, current rules in the same way uh, like I wouldn't be advocating that NATO ships go to Azov Sea, uh, but but surely you know the EU could take the sanctions regime against Russia more seriously. Right? There were sort of sanctions put in place after the annexation of Crimea, um, and 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 then sort of tied to to the Minsk agreements. But if you put sanctions in place, um, but after a while, through shell companies, through various ways of like hiding. Beneficiary ownership structures, uh, people get around those sanctions, and that's what exactly what's been happening with Putin's regime. And, and so, unless you sort of constantly improve and it sort of invest into in, 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 into it, it will become uh, it will sort of lose lose teeth over time. And that that's what's happened. That's what what's happened to to, to sanctions. So, uh, so it's really a question of. People being unwilling to sort of step up in situations where when, 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 when they should. I don't want to get to preach. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's the world we're living in, um, and and I think it's, it's a fundamental level. The problem is not even political. It's a problem of ideas, and 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 and, 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 and people across the West sort of internalizing what it means to live in a sort of self-governing society and protecting that society against against external threats. So. So my question is also related to cooperation among mm -hmm. heterogeneous governments and countries. So one problem, especially in a very particular uh, way, that if you have countries that are very large and countries that are small, for example, so co cooperation among these countries create a lot of gains, but these gains are not distributed equal. Yeah. So different countries gain different gains. So for example, if you want to follow the rule of reciprocity, you, you are going to have very limited cooperation because that limits how much cooperation you can have. So uh, that kind of problem exists even within countries, but within countries there are mechanisms that uh, you can compensate, like the losers, mm -hmm. you have a tax system, you have redistribution, but at the international level you don't have that. So uh, what kind of mechanism do you think we can have? There's, there are suggestions that maybe we can have a global tax system, that maybe we sh there should be a taxation at the global level and some redistribution at the global level to deal with that problem. But, um, that seems to be a major uh, impediment towards this global cooperation. For example, when you hear Trump saying that it's easy to win uh, trade wars, so it's probably he's wrong at, uh, when he says that it's easy to win against China, but it should be pretty easy to win a trade war against smaller countries like Mexico. Or, uh, so that that is a uh, that is a problem, in fact, and um, so I think I was wondering what kind of mechanisms you might think of. Yeah, I mean that, that, that's a hard one. So, so there's Danny Roderick, I think, who sort of has been writing about this notion that um, it's sort of hard to sustain. Uh, internationally speaking where there are large <coughs> questions of like distribution involved where like two parties disagree on how the surplus could be could be distributed and, and, and I think like, like the more salient those those distributional questions are the sort of more political the whole thing gets and uh, and, and potentially sort of difficult to, to, to handle in, 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 in some some rational way um, Again, I'm, like, I'm not an advocate of, of a global taxation system or like global political mechanisms to like deal with, with these, these things. I mean, it does sound positively utopian to me. Uh, I think they're like small institutional tweaks 
you when you think about uh, distributing surplus, I, th I think mechanisms that allow sort of shortened time horizons for these cooperation forms of cooperation might be helping. So if you allow for like periodic renegotiation or sunset clauses or sort of escape clauses where uh, you sort of give countries insurance that okay this is the way we are going to do things now but like if you don't like it you can leave in five years or, or, or go back to the table and then we also talk about how a surplus can be uh, can can be divided uh, that to me sounds like a like, like, a, like a helpful idea in, 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 in those in those contexts but I don't think you can like get away from the fundamental structure of the game like if there is there is a large surplus to be distributed in ways people disagree about um, that limit what, what can be achieved <coughs> in international cooperation. Maybe like rushing into, into those forms of cooperation uh, will, will not achieve good outcomes. But maybe even like Kyoto is, 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 is an example of is, is an example of that. So maybe they could all sit around the table and, and agree on, on on how we can to jointly reduce emissions. It's just Mike, do you have a follow-up on that? Yes, uh, I don't have a political solution, but I, um, I borrow from economic concept. Uh, that's why I ask you who has the before, who has great influence over the policy outcome, who has the residue climate. Uh, from economic view is, if the people who has greatest influence over the outcome should have gained the most, because they, they will have mm -hmm. the incentive to maximize the benefits. So I don't know how political sense would think of that, but generally common sense tells me people who take the most responsibility should be given the most gain to choose. Yeah, the problem is that, that so in Kyoto example, China uh, should reduce its uh, emission, so that would, they would have the most influence, but the benefit goes to everyone. Right? So, and there's no mechanism to pay China or compensate China for taking this action, so that, that is the problem. Yeah, I'd like to go back to a comment you made about the, the issue of how you uh, you um, uh, counter this ratchet effect that once a country gets in a NATO or an EU or something, it's hard to sort of get them out, even if they fundamentally change their nature. I think that's a really good question to pursue about thinking about global governance um, as well. But I but I encourage you to not use a mistaken sort of contrast with metropolitan governance um, because cities are not necessarily made up of homogeneous units either. Uh, and when Oster and Chibo and Vincent Oster and Chibo and Warren were doing the, the, the polycentricity approach initially and applied it to metropolitan governance, they weren't really assuming that these um, city managers or regional metropolitan regional managers had a system where they had nice that they were governing coherent groups with homogeneous mm -hmm. interests over local public goods. Uh, instead, they realized that there was, that different public goods would be valued very differently by different segments of that community, even of a small community. And that it would be a problem, it would be a task for the, po the political leaders, the ones who are deciding the, what they call the providers, what they're what local public goods should be provided for this this region as a whole, that was a political question. So it gets back exactly to what you were saying as a political question. Because the, the political leaders at the metropolitan level have to be responsive to the different interests in their constituency. And what you don't have is quite as big a this, 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 um, mismatch in size as you do between sort of the states and governments. But you still have corporations that do pretty well domestically versus small groups and stuff like that. So there's still that sort of a problem. So those problems are there at the local level too, okay? Uh, and and uh, Vince, this is one of the reasons I think Vincent really emphasized that administration at the local level or management, public management, is not really a, primarily an administrative process. It really is a political process. And, and he always argued for democratic public administration, some sort of way of taking account of the, um, the, the very divergent interests between the interest groups. Because there's a, there's a 
there's an easy sort of trap to fall into to think that also with Lynn's work on uh, self-governance, it's always these nice communities that are, they're all fishermen, so they all sort of agree with each other. No, 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 no. There's, there's some really strong differences of agreement within there, and, and governance even of, of small communities is very contentious, and there's a lot of politics involved in that. Uh, and so I, as, it's a point I think you were moving towards. Just setting up a polycentric structure isn't going to solve the problem if you don't have the right kinds of leaders in that structure that are able to balance trade-offs between different groups and be responsive to different groups at different in their different sources. It strikes me that like the necessary condition though is is, 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 is for those sort of organizing units to be sort of self-governing themselves. To have some options of sort of necessary unit the uh, necessary conditions so that there are different channels of influence onto those political yeah. leaders. But there's still a very important role for leadership that frankly neither neither Lynn or Vincent paid enough attention to. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that's that's open for further examination in this tradition, I think. But I but I, I like your I like your general sort of approach. It's a very interesting way of looking at polycentricity at the global level. Thank you. Kevin? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, about towards the any, beginning <coughs> excuse me, and the end of your speech. You touched on thinkers who have uh, defended a more robust form of polycentrism and European integration. I'd like to ask what sort of unifying institutions would be necessary to make that happen. So when I've read kind of those thinkers before, what that most reminds me of from uh, European history would be the Holy Roman Empire and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, more or less, uh, more of a loose union of people. And those polities had several major advantages which the current European Union does not share, although, of course, it had many disadvantages. So they had a common faith, they had a common monarch, and they had a common army, whereas the modern European Union does not. And both of those polities uh, collapsed under the pressure of modernity. So I'd like to question uh, if you have any response for would a polycentric order that's only defined by kind of a common commitment to liberal human rights generate enough attachment to be robust against waves of populism? I mean, if, if only I knew the answer. Because the sort of question about, uh, the, the, the question about like the cultural commitment mm -hmm. and the sense of allegiance, I think, is a fundamental one. And uh, if you want to have sort of political leadership and, 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 and able to solve these, these, these problems of cooperation in a, in a political sense, uh, but people have to perceive those solutions as, as legitimate and, and buy into them. I think one of the problems with the EU today, even with countries like Hungary and Poland, is, is, that, is that they don't really feel at home in, 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 in this sort of somewhat alien structure. And, and I'm not saying like, you know, whose who's fault it, it is, but it's, 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 it's just, an, just an observation. So, so I don't have a sort of answer to the to the deeper commitment question, uh, but in terms of just sort of federalist design grounds, I mean I would like the EU to change. Uh, and, uh, it's unhelpful, like you know, preaching. I would like the world to be different, but like the EU, if, if it's going to be a successful federal structure, it has to provide some uh, necessary. Europe-wide public goods, like common defense and a coherent foreign policy, uh, and it should not deal with questions that are sort of contentious and where the gains from, from, from cooperating are low. And and and, and it does a myriad of of, 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 of such things. Uh, and how do you achieve such a sort of institutional reform? Is Uh, some people, Brendan Sims is a historian at Cambridge, so he argues for like a big bank federalization. Sort of like, let's emulate the example of America's founding fathers and do a real constitutional convention. Uh, I mean, that happened in this country under, you know, in, a, in a state of great stress, and then there was like a one-off event. I don't know like what would have to happen in Europe to, to bring that sort of leadership 
about it. You need the right sort of people with the right sort of ideas at the right moment. I'm, I'm not sure we are anywhere there yet. One alternative proposed by this Italian political scientist, um, Gian Domenico Maggiore, who's been writing about this for, for a long time, is a sort of idea of, of accepting that the European institutions uh, have been sort of unhelpfully overreaching in many ways and that their ambitions were not matched by the tools that were given to their disposal and so that propelled these cycles of overreach and disappointment. So what should be happening instead of a big bank federalization is a sort of uh, unbundling of these different aspects of European integration. You already see that yeah, you know, European member countries, some are part of the Eurozone, others are not part of the Eurozone. I mean, they should make nominally all at some point join, but I mean, some have opt-outs and some who are even like, committed to joining are not going to join. The Poles and Swedes and, and Czechs, etc. Uh, you have European countries uh, <coughs> that are part of the Schengen space of passportless travel. You have countries that are not part of that. You have non-EU countries that are part of the European single market um, and that, that allow for passportless travel with the so, so, so it looks like these like different sort of public goods that are created are potentially separable, and and then you can have like different groups of countries like involved in in in, 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 in these sort of various projects that if, if they were like pursued in in, in 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 isolation. So, so, so this guy argues that, that that's the way forward. That that so put by political necessity we will we'll see sort of unbundling of of these of these different components. I I don't have sort of strong views on. on Although I've like, written about it and, 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 and it does keep waking me up at night. And I have actually a one in one of these chapters, I have something on, on the Holy Roman Empire and also the Hanseatic League and, and also the sort of classical gold standard, which anyway. So, um the other thing, the one thing that was missing from your talk is the rise of informal institutions mm -hmm. in the international arena and the roles that they're playing as either substitutes, complements, or rivals to these formal institutions. And so I'm, I'm thinking of these, you know, multinational corporation networks, the banking networks, and uh, even the rise of the INGO community yep. that's playing a lot of regulatory or watchdog. So there is, um, yeah, there is a whole lot of that going on. Um, I mean, I tried to sort of capture that in, in that sort of sheer, like, diversity of what, what was going on. So, so, for example, like, former international organizations in recent decades have opened themselves much more to various forms of dialogue and, 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 and sort of joint work with uh, what is sometimes called transnational actors. So either civil society, typically civil society, but also uh, also business businesses uh, it's something that was not like originally intended when, 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 when these things were formed through through international treaties uh, but it's happening and, and there is I think among like people who study these things uh, this sort of idea that maybe this could be helpful if it's shaped the right way if we make sure that the voices that are being heard are not always the same or biased in a, in a certain direction uh, and then maybe this is the beginning of a sort of gradual democratization of of the international realm, maybe sort of open access to to uh, to sort of engagement with, with, with these organizations to a broader array of actors. Um, I'm not sure I'm like willing to sort of buy into in, 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 into that vision, but but yes, I mean there is a sort of diversity of things happening. Some of them might be like competing against former forms of cooperation. You have international cooperation that is happening between government units, regulators get together and, and compare notes, um, and businesses get together and compare notes. The International Air Travel Association is a sort of, you can call it a cartel or, 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 or a sort of association of businesses, but I mean, it's sort of, it, all of it exists. Um, and I think you'll sort of see more of it going, going forward. and. Um, and, and so the question is like, how do you like cope with this sort of mushrooming of, of like different organizational networks that are becoming more and more complicated? Uh, I mean, I don't think it's a sort of easy thing. I don't think that there's any guarantee that it will like result in a 
terrific, great outcomes we should all embrace and love. Uh, but it's sort of like alternative, like states trying to like cocoon themselves into sort of self-sufficient national sovereignty and these are our laws and, and nobody will, other will have a say. I think that's not a viable alternative either. I'm wondering if your discussion of polycentrism at a global level implies that at local levels, so local levels would be not only metropolitan areas, but also small towns, small civic um, blobs on the map. Um, is the latter a prerequisite for the former? So is there a sense in which some kind of polycentric organization is um, scaled down and scaled up. I'm not sure is it necessarily the same organization that's being sort of scaled up and down. It's not the same organization, um, but, uh, I, but I'm, I'm in like cognitive my, science, so I'm thinking about it more as mental maps that yeah. people might have. But my, my, my instinct is, is, is that is, is, is yes, that like in, in those like instances that we see as sort of successes that have been successfully delivering public goods, etc., uh, like those have been created by self-governing countries or, or, or sort of units of, 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 of sort of self-governing countries, and and so so there is I think like a necessary condition for like these constituent parts of this wider transnational international orders to be. Uh, like open to contestation and, 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 and have some form of democratic legitimacy in, in the eyes of, 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 of the people they, they, they are supposed to serve. Like if you like insert North Korea into the mix, I don't think it's going to work. The, the issue of the mental maps is something I want to pick up on because it's an important one. Uh, there are your elections for the European Parliament coming yeah. up in 2019. and. Uh, it's interesting that up until now they have not elicited any any serious contestation and any serious interest on the level of national constituencies. Now it's interesting. Yanis Varoufakis, the former minister of finance of Greece, is going to to stand for election in Germany. And and it's interesting to see how that mental map will be configured because he is going to try to represent the German electorate uh, that uh, that might or might not feel connected to him. Now that would be, I think, a good sign to test whether the mental map has changed because up until now in many countries elections for the European Parliament is just a means of, of getting a few people to have a good standard of living for five years, uh, for yeah, traveling every week, uh, good uh, um, per diem expenses and a uh, lot of talk and very good election. So if you can, if you can in interest people in, in, um, in pushing for those elections, I think this would be a good, um, a good test. So I, I'm not sure whether Varoufakis will be elected in Germany, but if he, if he will, I think it's, it's going to be an interesting turning point. And the question is, uh, how can you get people interested in, in, in those kinds of uh, large scale? Uh, so I would like to like, read more on this sort of mental map Right. Well, I, I was just. I was just. If, if, uh, if you could directly, maybe like towards some of the because I mean, the, the, this obviously the way you framed it, like that's something that has been on people's minds uh, who study global governance. There are you know three schools of thought when it comes to this question of democratic legitimacy of, of international organization. The one school of thought is the John Bolton, Jeremy Rapkin, Roger Scruton school of thought, which is that, that it's, you know, it's evil and irredeemable and, and shouldn't exist and we should go back to sovereign nation states. The, the other school of thought consists of like, denying that there is a problem. Like, look, national democracy at the national level is also imperfect and, 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 and these international organizations consist of just like delegated power that can be repatriated. You know, what, what's your problem? Uh, and, and the third, and I think most sort of potentially fruitful avenue for research is, is, to, is to look at these forms of governance as in some way similar to sort of European nation states before they become democratic. Uh, that there were some sort of preconditions in the 19th century that led to the extension of suffrage and a sort of wider uh, 
the popular legitimacy of of, 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 of these regimes. I, I mean, I'm not sure what like exact reforms of these international organizations should look like as a, as, a, as a result, but maybe we should not think of them as they exist as 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 as, as, as being in best of you know like finished end states, but rather part of a sort of process that can that can lead us towards. Uh, more popular participation, democratic legitimacy, contestation, and, and, and all those things which are very often absent. It's a very Swiss idea, if I may say so. And Switzerland is not part of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a general theory, radical question about uh, how, to, how to realize democracy, democratic self government in. Cooperation. Uh, uh, French political thinker Pierre Manel is against the uh, uh, EU uh, because he thinks that only sovereign nation states can be a practical framework for self uh, democratic self government, while those international organizations, including EU, could only be governed by those te technocrats uh, without considering those electorates just seriously. So what would you first what would you think about the role of sovereignty in your uh, uh, discussion of uh, global polycentric governance and second uh, what would you what would be your uh, idea of of uh, democratic self government in those So, um, so let's separate those two questions. One, one is uh, really like the, the observation is that Pierre, Pierre Manon is, I think, like part of the same sort of school of thought on this as as, as, as you know, Roger Scruton, John Bolton, and and, and the other sort of critics of, of, of international cooperation. Like he sees uh, nation states as the only and legitimate sort of scope for 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 for, for, for democratic. Uh, decision making. I think it's the reductionist view that might reflect maybe like the French experience as, as, as like there is one center of power and, 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 and everything else that exists in that country sort of subsist. This is sort of part of the same sort of centralized sort of hierarchical system. Uh, but I don't think that that's the way. I don't think it's something that should be sort of taken for granted as sort of the baseline of history. Um, I mean, France itself is a result of a political project uh, as late as the like, early 20th and 19th century. Really, like markets were quite sort of fractionalized, there were very strong regional identities. Um, I don't think I, I don't see anything sort of necessary about the like, nation states as they are currently constituted, constituted as as being. Like the bedrock of, of the whole decision making, as opposed to, to other structures, some of them smaller, some of them bigger. And if anything, European history is is one where uh, there was a diversity of sort of uh, self governing, or to some extent self governing, sort of go forms of, 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 of government existing actually different different areas that like involved different levels of like centralization, decentralization existing. So I just don't accept the, the premise that the, the, we, the, the only thing that we have to work with is, 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 the, is, is the nation state. Um, now the question of sovereignty, which is related to this, is, is a tricky one because obviously it depends on, on what you mean by sovereignty. Right? Like is it sovereignty uh, as a sort of US American constitutional principle or is sovereignty as Westphalian sovereignty, like you don't they even respect other countries' borders, uh, and, 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 and sort of treat them as as, 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 as as equals in some fundamental sense. Or is it really sovereignty as as the sort of desire to, to have control over policies and outcomes? And, and I think those sort of lead to slightly Different perspectives on on, on on international cooperation. So, if if you are a sort of Westphalian defender of nation states, 
well, there's like, you know what's wrong with with countries uh, deciding that they'll make certain decisions together as long as as they can sort of revoke that form of delegation or that com form of commitment to to to, to cooperation. I, I I don't see that as a threat. Like if there is a threat to the Westphalian system, it's like nation states like you know invading other countries or, or blocking the the Kerch Strait uh, like 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 Ru Russia did uh, lately, not not sort of international organization if you don't like you know pooling your sovereignty so to speak you can you know you can leave the European Union you can like withdraw from treaties uh, there's nothing that, that prevents you from 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 from, from, from doing that um, and when it comes to the two other meanings of sovereignty one is uh, this sort of like distinctly American one like, like so you know is is, is the current level of like U.S. engagement internationally compatible with, with what's prescribed by the Constitution? And I think that like it opens a whole host of like important but but fairly technical questions, which to my mind uh, are not really central to, to, to this conversation. Like to say whether like treaties should be self-executing and, and, and or, or not, or whether there should be auxiliary legislation attached to them, passed by Congress. Uh, I think I'm not the not the biggest scholar, but but like I think I think that like the final and most important thing because like that's the way sovereignty is being used in, in most popular discussions is this sort of idea that a national government should have control over everything that's happening within its borders to some extent, so, you know, monopoly of violence, uh, and and that to me is uh, is just sort of utopian and detached from reality. Like it was never. It was never on the menu, and, and we should not like strive to to, to, to get it back on the menu. Um, so, uh, I think we have time for one more intervention. So, so I think it's not as easy as just pulling out of an agreement and not using your sovereignty. Because when you enter an agreement for a period of time, so your, your the structure of your economy is going to change. It's going to be so dependent on the foreign countries that uh, you have to basically stay up. If you pull out of the agreement, so you are not going to take your the control over your economy or country back, uh, you are going to be dependent. So that's one of the criticisms of this international relations uh, or, or the cooperation. Oh, but, uh, that's true of like any policy, right? Like, like sort of like policy, changing policies involves costs. No, but uh, you cannot say that you can get your sovereignty back. It's not like that. So you become dependent on other countries for supply of basic things. Uh, your firms are going to depend on other countries. Your financial system is going to depend on other countries. So sovereignty becomes, uh, it, it will have a completely different meaning after you globalize, basically. But you can still cut all ties and try to reconstruct all those parts. Yeah, but I mean, it's at least feasible. Uh, Stupid, but it's at least feasible. So it's not, the, so basically you will face a lot of pressure within well, your country, country that very not, to, not to cut yeah. those ties. So, and then a lot of other things comes with it. So you, your, there are a lot of cultural influences that come. Brexit will, will show this. It's a great slogan. Yeah. But I mean, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like with, with, with Brexit, I mean, the, like he, the UK has been part of the EU for over 40 years. Uh, so level of, of like economic integration is, is, is unprecedented. Uh, and so obviously there would be dramatic economic costs to like sudden disentangling of, 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 of the UK from the EU. But it's partly a sort of reflection of like all the economic ga economic gains that have been realized in the in the in, 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 in the meantime. Um, but I think there's a sort of fundamental difference between like imposing such economic costs on your country, withdrawing from an agreement, and 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 what like generation of my parents in Czechoslovakia experienced as violations of Czechoslovakia sovereignty when Soviet tanks came to Prague in 1968. And uh, so, so so I think like those those two things are sort of fundamentally different. Like like nobody like guarantees you costless exit from anything. Like even if I want to like change my bank account. Uh, I guess it will like, cost me like, time and money and, and, and yeah. it's inconvenient. That's why people would say we should not even enter. 
there is only one costless exit from this room because our time is up. <laughs> Thank you for uh, your participation and give a round of applause to them.